Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Hips and Sips 9.1 webinar. This is the schedule for today. We'll start with a presentation on what's new in 9.1 with some live demonstration at the end. This will take about 30 minutes. There will be some time at the end to answer questions as well. Presenting today is Burns Foster, that's me. I'm the product manager for Hips and Sips, and Fernanda Vienna from our training and support team. And just before we start, if you have any questions, please type them into the Google Webinar dialog. And we will answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. After the webinar, we will circulate all the Q&A responses to all attendees, including answers for any questions that didn't get addressed before the end of our time. Before we talk about Hips and Sips 9.1, for those of you that aren't existing customers, Teledyne Keras is a company that provides GIS software mostly to the hydrographic and marine community. Keras has been in business for almost 35 years and our software products are used all over the world. We have about 170 people in four offices and most of those in New Brunswick, Canada. We focus primarily on marine GIS. For any that aren't familiar with Hips and Sips, it's a comprehensive sensor data processing system. We support over 40 industry formats and easily handle large volumes of data. For more information, you can check out our website or contact us directly. Today, we're here to showcase some of the new tools available in Hips and Sips 9.1 with a focus on the new Sips Backscatter. But first, just a few smaller things in this release. An important note about compatibility, there have been no changes to the HIPS data structure in this version, so projects are backwards and forwards compatible between 9.0 and 9.1. We did spend some time working with Klein for this release and have updated support for their format, specifically support for their 3500 series sonars. We read their acquisition flags directly now and import the bathymetric data appropriately, and we cleaned up our imagery import as well. As part of our effort with Klein, we also added the Klein color palette. So that's available for the waterfall and mosaic displays. Finally, we spent some time optimizing some of our imports specifically for the high tech and Eplanix format, formats. And those are both up to about twice as fast as 9.0 for import. Just before we talk about the new SIPS backscatter engine, as part of that effort to make the workflow easier, we have two new dialogues for creating mosaics and beam patterns. We'll take another look at those at the end during the demo. The major new piece in the 9.1 release is the new SIPS backscatter engine. This new tool is designed as a complement to our existing SIPS geocoder implementation, and at the moment we support beam intensity data for most Kongsberg and Rezon systems. We will be supporting both SIPS backscatter and SIPS geocoder going forward, so our users have a choice in what approach they want to take. The SIPS backscatter takes a new approach to processing multi beam backscatter, specifically on how we handle the beam pattern. Many software packages for backscatter processing require the user to select a small sample of the dataset over a flat seabed with homogeneous texture, uh, preferably a sunny area, to generate the beam pattern. However, the problem with this approach is that most of the times the bottom type in the survey area is unknown. Um, this also introduces some angular dependence to the beam pattern, which can cause problems over varying bottom types. Uh, the approach in SIPS Backscatter is we feed the entire data set into the beam pattern calculation. The assumption is that the contribution of different bottom types at different angles of incidence will oscillate around a mean value for a particular angular sector. And over time, the true beam pattern will emerge. We wanted to make the implementation of SIPS Backscatter very easy to use for our users, and I think we accomplished that. Generating a mosaic with SIPS backscatter is only one extra step at the end of a typical multi-beam workflow. To accomplish that, we made sure to use as much information as we can from the raw data, minimizing how much the users have to enter manually. That includes things like transmit power, receive gain, frequency, pulse length, any configuration parameters of the sonar that will affect the backscatter. The beam pattern is easy to manage as well. It can update every time you need to add data to the mosaic, even over multiple surveys. Another benefit of SIPS Backscatter is fully documented algorithms. We know exactly what it's doing, and that information is also available to our users. In fact, this is probably a good time to talk about exactly that. So this is an overview of what happens under the hood in SIPS Backscatter. We'll talk about each step here in detail and how we apply our gradient metric corrections to get processed imagery into a mosaic. As part of the simplified workflow, the geometric corrections are simply the multi-beam bathymetry as you've already processed in HIPS, so there's no additional effort there. But if that looks a bit complicated from the user's point of view, 
It's a single additional step after your standard multi-beam processing workflow. As I mentioned previously, we put in considerable effort to minimize input from the user to make the workflow easier. We read the process bathymetry from HIPS, and from the raw data, we pull in all applicable real-time sonar parameters. And that includes things like operating frequency, beam widths, transmit power, and receive gain, etc. The only input required from the user for processing is the local temperature and salinity, which we use to apply our time-varying gain correction. These numbers are fairly insensitive, so a simple average for the area at the time of survey is all you need, and it's really only absolutely necessary if the conditions change drastically day to day, or if you have data from more than one sonar that you'd like to mosaic together. So the first thing we apply are the standard intensity corrections for time varying gain, transmit power and receive gain, and in sonified area. So we'll look at each of those first. For Rezon systems, they compute a TVG correction in real time and apply it to the stored backscatter. We compute the same TVG and back that out, and then apply our own transmission loss correction using the user provided coefficients for absorption. At the moment, we don't do the same for Kongsberg data, as our online corrections are a bit more involved and a little more complicated to back out. So for a visual on our TVG correction, on the left is a sample raw of raw imagery from Women's Bay, Alaska. And here is the imagery with our TVG correction applied. On the right is a difference grid between the two, and we'll be using the same presentation style for the other correctors. We also compensate for online power and gain changes to make sure we have a consistent dynamic range between lines in the output imagery. And here's the, the before and after of the gain corrected image with the difference grid on the right again. Although there are no step changes within the image, you can see the intensity range changing from, with about a 20 decibel shift in the difference. And the last correction is to compensate for the insonified area. Uh, many algorithms make a simple conical calculation based on beam width to calculate this. But we take a more rigorous approach by calculating the intersecting area of the beam footprint with the, false, with the pulsed footprint, accounting for the beam incident angle. And just a side note here, you can choose to use the beam data to calculate a slope for the surface normal, or you can use any existing Caesar surface. And here we see the before and after result of the area correction with the difference grid on the right. At this step, we store the corrected imagery in each HIPS line folder for reuse later. HIPS is smart about tracking these files, and the only time they get regenerated is if the absorption parameters for TVG or the source of the slope calculation are changed. And the great thing is, running a new mosaic the second time around is very, very quick. Now that we have a corrected image, we can compute our beam pattern. First, we normalize the intensities by projecting the insonified area to a plane perpendicular to the beam vector and by the total power in the pane. And this accounts for small power gain fluctuations in certain sonars. We compute the beam pattern from that normalized intensity. And as we outlined previously, a classic approach here would be to extract the beam pattern from a homogeneous area of flat bottom. However, in practice, many surveys are conducted over an unknown bottom type, and the resulting beam pattern will, have, will inevitably have some angular dependence. So SIPS backscatter will instead use the entire data set to compute the beam pattern, with the assumption that the contribution of different bottom types oscillate around a mean value. The more data you feed into the beam pattern, the better it gets. We generate the beam pattern in tenth of a degree increments over the swath, and then average these angular bins over many panes. Here's the before and after of applying the beam pattern with the difference image on the right. And this particular data set is over a very small patch of seafloor, so we don't see any artifacts at this point from the sediment response. We'll look at some larger data sets in a moment to discuss our angle varying gain correction, our optional final step. So here's the bathymetric surface of the full survey we've seen so far. Uh, this was a rec development survey up in Alaska. Here's the raw backscatter before applying corrections, and the final compensated mosaic. And again, bottom type in such a small area was very consistent, so we didn't need to worry about an angle varying gain correction. So switching over to the shallow survey 2015 data set, we have a long stretch of two lines trailing out from the main survey area over some interesting rocky seabed. Looking at the backscatter, we see some residual artifacts in the imagery, and these artifacts are the result of a change in the sediment acoustic response over this region. 
After applying the beam pattern, we also apply a despeckle function to the image to clean it up before mosaicing. We look at each pixel in the imagery, and if the difference between the current pixel and the mean value of its neighbors exceeds a certain threshold, we replace that intensity by the mean value computed from those same neighbors. And the last step in creating a SIPS backscatter mosaic is applying an angle varying gain correction, although this correction is optional. We calculate the intensity curve as a function of incident angle, average it over a certain window size supplied by the user. We then normalize the curve using an average of the values between 30 and 60 degrees. And applying that to the shallow survey data, we see the final artifact free image. So now we'll turn off the PowerPoint slides and do a live demo of these new tools. Okay, so after this explanation on theory, let's move to the application. Um, now you're gonna see the practical side of things. So for those unfamiliar with HIPS interface, uh, this is a session open with a, a project lines and a bathymetry surface um, already processed, uh, bathymetry already processed and uh, on, on the main display you can see the navigation lines and, and the surface created and this is part of the common data set provided uh, during shadow survey 2015 and data was acquired with the residency bed 725-400 kilohertz sonar. Um, on the project window you can see the project structure with all the lines listed and if you select the lines, you can see on the on the separate selection, you can see everything that was applied to that line. Um, so after following all necessary processes and lines were merged in HIPS 9.1, we can proceed to create a mosaic. Um, and although the icon is the same, to create a, the, the create mosaic dialog has changed, and now it's similar to the import auxiliary data. Um, on the drop-down list, we have option to choose between the algorithms available. We have six backscatter and geocoder as backs backscatter processing engines, and we have six side scan for side scan data. And on the general components, um, we're going to bring in all the lines, so all the track lines for this uh, mosaic creation. Uh, you have the option of bringing only the selection as well, and the source type is the beam average. Um, note that the red, um, the red fields, they are mandatory, so we have to set up a name for this mosaic. And we have all the other properties of this mosaic, as the, the color map, we have also the option of editing the mosaic, we have to choose a resolution for it, the coordinate, the coordinate system is by default the same as the project, but the user can change it if, if it wants to. Um, the extents by default are the current view of the main display. Uh, you can also change that if you know the coordinates that you want to um, set up to. You can draw a box around the area. Um, and the imagery corrections, um, we are we have all the options for the backscatter processing so we have the avg we have the, the choice to apply it or not we have the beam pattern and about the beam pattern um we have uh we have the option of creating a new beam pattern we can also update or override the 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 beam pattern created. Uh, so the update is good if you want to add more information to your mosaic, so you have, if you have other lines to add it. Um, you have to choose a name for it. Uh, you have also the local absorption options of temperature and salinity. Uh, and you have a filter by angle uh, from the nadir. And for the geometric corrections, you have the process depths or a surface. Um, you have to, to choose one. Um, and the advanced options, you have uh, intensity filter. And also you have the sound velocity. If the sound velocity is not, um, not, not informed by the, the data set, you can also input here. Um, so basically, if you have everything set up, 
you can save that as a template. So we have a template here. And that template will contain uh, all information needed. Um, if you need to add anything, you can edit the template by clicking on the pencil, and then allows you to change anything for the mosaic creation. Um, and after that, it, you just need to save the template again, and then press OK. That will create a new mosaic. So we have a new mosaic here already created. And in this mosaic, um, now the idea is that with the mosaic created, it will help the user to correlate all the intensities with the seabed properties and features. So it can serve as an input for several types of interpretation. And in HIPS, we provide tools for interpretation on 2D. In that case, you can uh, work with the project, uh, the, the, the mosaic uh, properties, so you can change, twist all the properties around, and you can also uh, work with features. So we can uh, do vector interpretations on, on the mosaic. In this case, we have a rack inter interpreted here. If you zoom in, there's a rack, and this is the interpretation of the rack. Um, you can export that after if you want to. So besides the 2D, um, we also have a 3D. So on the 3D view, you can basically drape the mosaic over the bathymetry. And let me just change here. And now you can confirm your interpretation. So here you can see the rack, and you can also see different features on the seabed over the bathymetry, so that makes easier for all the interpretation. Rotate everything around. And yeah, so that's the... Uh, with this data set, you can also export the mosaic in GeoTIFF to ASCII, and you can use this as input in other um, studies. Um, so besides that data set, we have another example. So I'm going to close this session and going to open a new one. So the new session, we have a data set. Um, this was... So this mosaic was a uh, result from different survey vessels and each with its own beam pattern used for the processing. And some areas are missing due to acquisition problems with our vessel. Uh, this survey is from the northern coast of Washington State in the U.S. And where the mosaic lands, you don't see, um, you don't see much difference. It's basically the same feature um, the same uh, intensity where it lands. Uh, here you can see the differences due to the ABG. But the, the, the nice thing about this, um, you can see the difference between the rocky areas and the rest of the seabed. So these are well defined, which is nice for interpretation. And basically, um, that's what I had to show you. And again, if you have any questions, you just write them on the, the go-to webinar dialog. Um, we can answer them in a few moments. Okay, <clears throat> that concludes the Hips and Stips 9.1 webinar. Thanks to everyone who took to some time out to tune in. A pre-recorded version of the webinar will be posted to our YouTube channel shortly if you want to watch it again or share it with colleagues. We'd also like to mention the Karis World Tour for 2016, a series of information sessions we're hosting around the world this year. Each stop includes a combination of information sessions, software demonstration, and hands-on exercises with the latest Karis technology. We'll be talking about the next generation of Karis software and other technology trends that will reshape the hydrographic industry. And here are the current dates and locations for our World Tour stops. You can find more information and register for a World Tour stop from the CARES website. One last thing before we get to the questions. Many of you have likely already heard the news, but we were recently acquired by Teledyne. We're all very excited about that here. For the benefit of everyone listening, though, we wanted to let you know it's business as usual. 
Teledyne Keras will continue offering the same quality software and services as we did before. And that's the end, so now we'll switch to questions from you. You can type them into the questions pane on the GoToWebinar interface. Thank you. Thank you.